Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Common Ground. I'm your host, Ashley Hall. Common Ground is a weekly series that highlights northern and central Minnesota culture. Each week, we'll explore the unique people, places, and events that are an important part of our region. Each week, Common Ground videographers, editors, and myself will take viewers on a journey of exploration into the worlds of art, history, and culture. This week on Common Ground, we'll introduce you to a father-son team from Bagley who create wild wood flowers. A former hockey coach from Bemidji State University gives us a lesson on hockey history and meet a Bemidji author who creates children's stage plays to dark tales. I've been working wood for a lot of years. I said between the two of us, uh, Nathaniel, my son and I, we have 90 years of woodworking experience when we both started building forts when we were four years old. The business was called Wooden Things. And then when Nathaniel came back uh, about five years ago and joined me in the business, we incorporated and uh, called the company Wood Wildflowers because that is indeed now what we do. We do laminations of a lot of uh, a lot of thicknesses of wood. We'll go and uh, do the part that's going to go with this vase, uh, sunflower. This is a pattern for one of the flowers that uh, are the, the latest flower, again, one of Nathaniel's designs. For me as a father, I couldn't be prouder. It's a really neat thing. Just do a pattern, simple pattern. Draw them on, it's, it's simple to draw it on, it's not necessarily uh, so simple once we move on to the next step. And this will then go to the bandsaw as well. So come into the bandsaw. This particular piece I'm gonna run on, on this grizzly bandsaw. These flower petals I'll be doing on another bandsaw over there. The bandsaw is one of our uh, tools of choice, probably because we cut, the wood we cut is so thick. It, uh, this seems to work really well. What we find with the bandsaw is you can do so many things when you, by changing the table, the, the, the degree of angle of cut, and all of a sudden you're into some really interesting designs. So that's that. I'll leave this here for Nathaniel. I'm going to go on now and I'll cut out the sunflower that will go in that vase as well. Well, I'm coming into the next bandsaw that I'm using to cut out these flower parts. First thing I have to do is I always rough them out before I take them on to the, the, the next saw, which is the for slicing them thins. We found that uh, we can't really use veneer. If we don't cut the pieces, they will take a natural bend that we, we can't work them through our forms and, and get the shape out of them that we wanted to do. So slicing them is about our best option. Now we've created a pattern that we can we can take further. First thing we'll have to do is drill some holes in it, which I have already done in a piece. Uh, you can see already that the patterns are not exactly alike, but it's also one of the beauties of, of, of what we do is no matter how many times we cut these out, you'll never have two flowers that are exactly the same. This is what we're getting down to is thin strips of wood like so that we can then cut off and take further in the process. So now uh, we'll turn you over to Nathaniel. This is, I think my job here is done. I get to, actually after this point in time, I usually get to go out, grab a cup of coffee, walk down to the pond and maybe get an idea or something. Hi, my name is Nathaniel Nino and I'm gonna continue the process on this base that, uh, that my dad started. So first of all, I have the table on the bandsaw set at about a nine degree angle. And I'm gonna finish the sculpting on this base and what that's gonna allow me to do, it's gonna cut down through the grain at an, at an angle and create a really nice pattern on the face of the base.
After my, my dad has sliced these flower petals into really thin strips, I'm just gonna break them out into individual petals so that they're ready to be sanded and bent. Now they're ready to move on to sanding and final bending. Now we can take these petals over and soak them in hot water and they'll soak for 15 or 20 minutes and they'll be ready to bend. They're gonna dry for uh, three or four days and once the wood is totally dry, uh, those petals will hold their shape forever. So after the petals have dried for, uh, like I said, four or five days, we're gonna take those petals out of the forms and then stain them. And here's a box that I've just finished staining. We have uh, enough to do uh, probably about 80 or 100 flowers in here, all nice and bright yellow. So these are gonna be our sunflowers. And now I'm gonna show you how we do our final assembly on the sunflowers. For stems, I use eighth inch dowels. Uh, I stain them green and then soak them in hot water again and bend them very similarly to the way we bend the, the flower petals. So I'm just gonna start by grabbing a handful of these yellow petals and assembling them onto the stems one at a time. And then just a few dabs of cyanoacrylic glue to finish it off. And we'll let that dry for a few minutes. So the final touch for the sunflower is gonna to be to add the seed area to the center. So for that, I have some black walnut wood shavings. So they create that nice, coarse, bumpy texture. They have the right color and it allows us to stick with the wood theme so that truly the flower is entirely made out of wood. A Little bit of hot glue, just gonna fill in and I'm just gonna take a whole handful of this black walnut shavings and dump it right on. And there we have the finished sunflower. All right, so now I have some of my finished sunflowers uh, they have a couple of coats of lacquer on them, so they do have a nice sheen to them, makes them easier to dust. And I'm going to just arrange them in this vase. I also have my accompanying leaves. Uh, they're bent in the same fashion as the flowers are bent. Hot water forms four or five days, and they will also hold their shape forever. So I'm just poking all the little pieces right down into the foam. So I like to think of what we do is it's part design, it's part artist, wood artistry, it's part engineering to come up with all the ways to make everything and then we get to finish it off by being part floral designers. Having those creative moments is wonderful. Uh, seeing it come to fruition through the production st steps is really good, but Going out there and actually selling a part of your time in one of your pieces and having somebody willing to, to spend their hard-earned money and what they do to buy a piece of your work is, you know, that's pretty gratifying. I'm Roy C. Booth, and I write. Okay, I guess I'm gonna see that, that. That's the one question I get asked all the time, and I don't have a pet answer for it anymore because there's so much stuff involved. So usually it's, it's I'm Roy C. Booth. I write books, plays, movies. What do you need? That's just cheap and simple. Good. 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 You got some ideas for <laughs> What? You got some ideas for me? I, you know, tonight was uh, Odd Hat Two, uh, uh, produced by Greg Gassman. Uh, basically six different playwrights, such as myself, get together and we draw the hat at a location, an object, and how many actors and actresses we use. And tonight there were six of us that did that. And then tomorrow, 
hopefully by 8 o'clock a.m. We have all have our scripts written out by that time. And then six directors will pick which show they'll take, and then they'll pick the actual the cast and crew that they're going to use. Okay. All right. Next, uh, Roy C. Booth. A nursing home. Perfect! <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh, I'm glad. That's cool. That's fun. <laughs> nursing home. Okay. Object. A toy cow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're everywhere. You guys just have to go to the nursing home. <laughs> Your first line. Did Bill... Bring the pizza. Oh. All right. So spicy. <laughs> Whoops. Spicy. Two men and two women. All right. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Well, rest of the evening for me is a lot of water, a lot of time at the computer, and, and little sleep. Um, personally, for this one, I'm, I have to do, let me check here. I have to do a location, a nursing home, a toy cow, and my opening line is, did Bill bring the pizza? I've done script work in the past where, where you know, I had to get a scene done within you know, 15 minutes to two hours. For film, so that that for me that's nothing new in that regard. Except this time I'm shooting for 15 minutes worth with a beginning, a middle, and an end. So tonight, you know, I'll sit down, I'll get the play figured out. Um, probably first thing I'll do is, is try to figure out what my plot points are, what my overall premise is, that sort of thing. And then I will probably write up an outline. We'll do from there. Uh, usually I use an outline when I do my writing, um, mostly for plays and for for the um, for films. Uh, which, which helps because uh, now that I've get, uh, get to the point where I've got over 50 plays published, it you know, cuts down on my prep time and a lot of things like that also. Uh, matter of fact, I did a little prep time for this beforehand, just getting like, my basic outline set up and a few other things, and now I just have to go in and plug things in, so to speak. Out of the hat was, was a good experience to find out if, if certain basic elements of the script worked or not. There's certain key elements that you can always pick out, you know, to see if you know, the plot worked or, or some of that subtext I was talking about works or not. So it was very you know, good for that. I know the actors enjoyed it. I know the audience enjoyed it. So in, in that respect, it, it's, it's always a very you know, strong plus. Yeah, I think everybody really in, enjoyed the production. Well, the entire evening, the the entire evening, the entire think, was, evening. was a good thing. That I also put a lot of theatricalism in my plays. I, I like sound cues. I like different light angles. I like different, you know, things they, you can do they decided, with the physicality of the stage. They decided to run with it. They decided to run with it, and they wanted to do incorporate a lot of the aspects into it instead of paring it down. Um, but it, it made for a, well, for well, a, well, a well, harder well, show to do, I think. The, the director himself said, Mike Breeden said, you know, you know, there's a lot more show going on here for one rehearsal. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I get that a lot. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry. Yeah. I know how it feels to get dropped off and abandoned here. <clears throat> it sucks. It really, really sucks. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, and I'd like to apologize to you, Mr. Butternuts. <laughs> well, I, I sold my first short story in uh, 1979 when I was 14. And I've basically been told, you know, I, I had some stuff published before, like when I was eight. You know, that sort of thing, you know, locally in school and whatnot. Uh, my first thing I ever wrote that I really remember having a full impact on people was a, uh, you, you know, when, when, when you, in school they make you make those little books? My, my fellow classmates, little books about, you know, four or eight pages about bunny rabbits and, and 
doggies and whatnot. Um, I, I did a 20 page opus on myself running around with a silver baseball bat, running around a haunted house, um, wailing on vampires, zombies, and werewolves. My, my mom still has it somewhere. Um, I, ironically, uh, my mom also got a call from, from, the, uh, <laughs> from the school about it. Um, but I noticed that my, my fellow classmates had a really strong reaction to it, so I started writing little cartoons and, you know, doing little skits and whatnot, and I, it just, just carried over through my later years. I noticed in the paper they had me down as, as, as a gothic horror guy, which, which I, I take great pride in, but I'm, I'm mostly known, well, for example, for, you know, for plays, I'm mostly known for children's plays in some respects. Um, some people, like down Twin Cities, know me as the as the, a science fiction fantasy writer. Uh, I know in, in England I'm, I'm known for a little bit for other things. So it, it, it goes all over the place. Uh, basically I consider myself a, uh, a speculative fiction writer, meaning I like to write uh, science fiction, fantasy, horror, um, weird westerns, I've done a few of those, uh, mysteries. I explained to someone a while back that uh, the genre appeals to me, or those genres, that uh, I like the, uh, the exploration of ideas. You know, I read a lot of Jules Verne when I was little, and it was interesting, you know, later on as an adult to find out, oh, he wrote about, you know, submarines before there were actually were real functional submarines like that, and, and you, know, you know, rockets to the moon and that sort of thing. But she passed it to go back to Cyrano de Bergerac, believe it or not was actually considered one of the first science fiction writers because he wrote about going to the moon and things like that. Um, so I, I always like the idea of, of it's a genre that, that you're not limited. There's, there's no limitations. Now you can say that into memoir writing or creative nonfiction if you had to, but I, I just like the idea you know, of, of exploring ideas and, and taking them to possibly places that no one else has before. The first hockey team started here in Bemidji and it was played really on the ice. It was kind of a town team, and more than one even. And the, the very beginning, it was a case of being part of the winter carnival that they held. And it was down at the uh, foot of Third Street, where Paul Bunyan's statue is right now, and it, right out there. That, that's how that kind of got going. And then, of course, uh, by 1936, a rink, city rink was built which was a combination of curling and hockey arena. And that curling part of it well, existed until uh, 1967. But uh, the hockey rink was a victim of a roof cave-in because of heavy snow. And as a result, 1950 was the end of hockey in Bemidji. And uh, part of that also was the fact that the Bemidji State University, well then it was called Bemidji State Teachers College, uh, started playing hockey in 1947-48. And then it, it ended uh, in 1950 with the demise of the arena. Well you see, President Bangsberg, when he hired me, uh, is an amazing man. He was 34 years old and he was president of this university. And uh, he in essence, convinced me to take this position. I was, at that time, head coach at the University of North Dakota. And uh, what appealed to me was the opportunity to build a program. It, it, there's a vast difference between perpetuating a program and building one. And I, because of where I grew up, uh, on the border, International Falls, Fort Francis, Ontario. I understood totally what was happening to this game uh, in the state of Minnesota. So you know, I understood what he was talking about as far as the, the culture and why we should be doing this. And uh, that was the reason I came and of course uh, the reason I stayed because it's, it's difficult work building a program but it, it's more rewarding. And perpetuating program. The uh, administration provided $100 for sticks and some old jerseys that were used by, uh, I believe, football. And the goalie equipment was donated 
by the International Falls Minnesota Youth Hockey Association. And that's how hockey started here at Bemidji State University. And uh, then when they resurrected the program in 1959, that picture right there with the football uniforms. And that's uh, Vic Weber, uh, who was the coach, and uh, he's, uh, there he is. We've had three coaches here since 1959. And this is Tom, of course, the current coach. This is uh, retired coach, Dr. Vic Weber, and, and this is me. It has had a profound effect. And it goes uh, further than just the, the building of rinks. We have to talk about the new city arena in the John Glass Arena that came uh, into line in November of 1967. And so that was the time when hockey at the high school level was just starting to evolve. It began about 1964, really outdoors, during Bemidji High School playing. And of course, uh, hockey at the university started up uh, again in 1959, but it was outdoors. And as far as the university was concerned, they wanted to start that program because they had put in a request to build a hockey arena, which was called really a John Glass Field. Well, it was a field house at the time. It was subsequently named John Glass shortly thereafter, but it was a combination dance studio, uh, wrestling, locker room facility, and a hockey rink, which had an indoor track around it. Not a very good one, but it was an indoor track. And um, that came into line in 1967. The uh, high school started to play their games in there, and they practiced in the city arena. We were on the scene with a rink at a time when high school hockey in Minnesota was just bubbling and gurgling, and it was growing at a pace you know, as fast as a prairie grass fire, really. And we were sitting here with this facility. And in those days, there were only seven teams in the WCHA. We had seven Division I hockey teams in the West, and that included Michigan, Michigan State, Michigan Tech, Minnesota, the University of North Dakota, Colorado College, and Denver. That's all it was. And, and that's the way it was in the uh, 50s and 60s. Well, they couldn't handle all the players that were coming up. Consequently, many, many outstanding players simply were not able to find a place to play, and we were here. And that is why we were able to get those players that were definitely Division I player caliber, of course, and um, uh, th those players went on to make the U.S. national team. Some of our players, the U.S. national team, the U.S. Olympic team, played in the uh, National Hockey League and uh, played in Europe. Good heavens, you know. That was a, a sign that this game is going places. It's, it's growing and we just happen to be there first. We we're fortunate in having that indoor facility, but. My first year, we were outdoors while this John Glass Field House was being built. And of course, we had to, I was involved with the uh, first hockey conference that we played in, the Beavers. And uh, um, it always is a case of, of, of finances and uh, funding a program. We were fortunate in that almost immediately when we were inside, that the fans gravitated to the building and we were able to generate a considerable amount of, of income. This would be uh, like 47, 48 and you could buy a season ticket, good for six games, that's kind of, they didn't play much in those days, and uh, $1.80, tax included. What other sport? where you're standing three, two and a half inches up off of the surface on about an eighth of an inch of steel and you don't handle 
the puck in your hands or the, the ball in your hands. It's on the end of a 60 inch stick. <laughs> it takes some skill to do that. The puck, uh, when shot with a, with a slap shot, can travel uh, up to and over 100 miles an hour. And you can't run out of bounds. So you have to be kind of kind of quick. <laughs> uh, and you have the goaltender. That's totally unique. Not to mention the Zamboni, which seems to attract the attention of, of uh, really young young people, you know, children. But it's um, it just uh, it's part of our culture because of our geographic location, our climate. And it's a long, long winter. I just can't even imagine what it would be like to endure a winter with no hockey. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed the show and we look forward to seeing you next week right here on Common Ground. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground, please contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. segments or copies of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.